<laughs> yes, we're just waiting on Stephanie to join us, but I'll just go ahead with the preamble. Hi, I'm Yanni. I'm Betty. We are seated here with Gabriella Mello. Uh, Broward-based, not Miami-based, Broward representation, right, as she said, uh, Brazilian photographer, multimedia artist, uh, collector of places, people, and memories, as she put in her artist statement. So welcome, Gabriella. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Well, obviously, you have to come, right? You know, it's kind of like <laughs> mandatory. But we're here at Diafano. This is a nonprofit gallery based in Little Haiti. Uh, or maybe this is like Miami Shores. I don't know. We're in Miami. Basically, we are here to promote local art uh, in Miami. Uh, and all the proceeds of all the work sold go 100% to the artists. We are here just to bring a platform to local art uh, entirely free. So that is really important to the mission statement. And just wanna give a quick shout out to Shotgun for uh, letting us use their space, uh, collaborating with us. Other collaborators are Concreta Sala, Probide. Also, thank you for joining us on this sleepy Sunday, rainy afternoon. We appreciate you all for being here and for tuning in, but this is also a very special day because not only was it Betty's birthday two days ago, but it is also Stephanie's birthday, Diafano Queen, so clap it up for those two Aquarius Queens. Happy birthday, Yes. Guys. Yes, so stick around after, have some refreshments, and we'll be celebrating that as well after the interview. Um, but yes, let's just get into it. So uh, the name of this exhibition is uh, Before I Say Goodbye, or in my very butchered, is it Spanish? Antes? It's Portuguese, it's Antes de Me Despedir. Okay, I'm really glad I didn't try to pronounce that. Cool, 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 <laughs> awesome. So yeah, so Gabriela, you are yeah Broward-based Brazilian photographer, multimedia artist. You also went through the trouble of um, having a Portuguese explanation on all your didactics, which I really love. Uh, it makes the show very uh, accessible and also speaks to your heritage, which is beautiful. Um, oh, also, I really, I forgot to say this, and I wanna start saying this at the panels. Shout out to the DJs also. There's Stephanie herself, Fefa, and also House of Priests, so shout out to them. Woo! Yes is guaranteed. So um, yeah, there are some verbiage that I want to go over with you in your artist statement that really jumped out at me. Um, you said that you were feeling rooted in a time in which home feels uncertain in this show. And so that really stuck out to me because it seems like a deeply personal statement. So to whatever degree you're comfortable with, would you care to elaborate on that? Like what is uncertain about the idea of home for you in this moment? So as, as someone who hasn't been back to their birth country since they were three, um, home is, it can have a lot of different meanings, right? Um, but I definitely hold on to a lot of the nostalgia and a lot of the images and things that my grandmother was able to preserve to, be, to have me feel more connected to that sense of home. Um, I would want to elaborate a little bit more on what that means, but I just don't feel totally comfortable delving into like immigration and all of that. But totally. um, yeah, absolutely. That's definitely a part of my journey. So. Yeah, for sure. I definitely get the sense through this work that you are, you know, provoked by this event of your grandma passing away, right? It's very beautiful that this sort of passing of life inspires you to breathe new life into these lives that have passed on. You're not only a collector of these people's memories and places, you are also a sort of like necromancer in the sense that you are taking something that has passed on to another realm and you're breathing new life into it. You actually, I just saw you take a picture in front of your like family tree. Is it safe to call it that, I guess? It's a sort of... Yeah, for sure. Um, it, I would call it a family tree. It's more of um, a collage, though, yeah. I like that concept and I love that you took a picture in front of it, sort of like adding your face to the lineage. It's very uh, self-aware, it's very like temporally like aware of like this future and this present is going to be the past eventually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think what inspired that piece too is um, 
So my, my grandmother, she was a lover of the arts, right? She loved um, painting, coloring, music, and dance. And um, growing up, there was this enormous collage in our home. It was in, it was in the bedroom. And so I would see it every morning when I woke up. And um, it was a collage that she had made of all of our relatives. And they were you know, spaced out all throughout, and it was enormous. It was so big that like every time I'd look at it, I'd find another portrait that I hadn't seen before. Wow. And um, so, uh, sorry, I forgot, I lost my train of thought there. But yeah, so that, that portrait was, uh, or sorry, that collage was like a huge inspiration for this collage that I made as well. Um, it was, thinking back, like to be able to like, focus in on a different portrait of a family member and and learn more about each one um, and, and ask her. It's really a beautiful way to learn about like my family history in that way. And also amazing that she was able to save all of those images and, and make it into something for herself and for us to like feel connected to our family in that way. Um, you know, there there's an author, uh, Marianne Hirsch, who said that um, family portraits um, exist um, within this idea of a narrative. So there, you can transform something that's just behind a frame into a story. It becomes much more than just um, a reflection of something. It becomes more alive because it's, it's through that act of narration and of telling these people's stories that we're able to keep that lineage alive. Absolutely, I really love the mementos piece um, for that reason because you are recontextualizing these things that are otherwise somewhat mundane. They're just pictures of people, but really you're highlighting how much they mean to you by putting them in these ornate frames. And also the fact that these are not all just the same frame. They each have their own little intricate personalities, which I love. And I also want to call attention to the fact that you did compare these to the larger format of, okay, in noble families they have large, port like painted elaborate portraits, whereas all we have are these small miniatures. But I think there is something beautiful about that because much like this photo album that you source these from has traveled hundreds of miles through decades, these sort of maintaining that, that small scale allows you to keep these with you and they can keep traveling like with you wherever you go. So it makes them sort of more fluid, it makes them more accessible to future generations in the family, and it's more intimate, too. You yeah. need to literally hold this person in your hands, so. Right, exactly, and I think in the same way that I was able to interact with the collage of my family, I kind of wanted the viewer to be able to do that as well. It, it'd be intimate and kind of like, I mean, you don't know these people's stories, right? So whether you ask, like so many of you have tonight, about like what you know, who are these people in the frames, right? The same way that I did, you might, you know, create your own narratives in your own head about who these people might be and, and therefore even bringing more life to, to what they are too. For sure. Is there any, like, um, the way that you arranged these in this collage, it looks very intentional. Was there like a system? Yeah, um, I went through a few iterations of this, but um, I think I, I landed on this one just because I wanted her to be at the center, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's a lot of religious iconography and a lot of um, Latin upbringing in general, but especially mine, and so I really wanted to have like that cross of her in the center. Um, and so, yeah, and then have the entire family like surrounded by her because she she's kind of like the reason why I'm here and why um, you know a lot of my family is here as well. And so I I definitely wanted to highlight her importance of that. And then she's just surrounded by all of her cousins, um, nephews, and children. I love that. I love having her as a central node because. You know, like you said in one of the didactics, um, she is a very strong matriarch and her absence has touched a lot of people. So it's sort of like a ripple effect I'm, I'm seeing here where she's in the center and then the people closest to her immediately around her and their offspring and so on and so forth. So I think that's a really cool way of showing that. So let's talk about the altars behind us. This is a really interesting series and they're, it's a triptych. 
So there's a lot of meaning in the number three, a lot of like divinity. Could you like elaborate more on why you chose that number? I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, so this, this image on the left um, uh, on the beach, um, there, there's a collage in the center of that image. Um, I created a, this collage in homage to her, and it's, it's a trinity, it's a goddess trinity, so the mother-daughter mother, crone, and it's kind of like the inception of this idea of uh, the triptych of the Three Altars series. Um, and so I, I really wanted to um, highlight, again, um, a lot of like religious imagery that comes about in a lot of Latin American art, like like works from like Anna Mendieta, like works from um, Edra Soto, and even Carlos Jaramillo, who all kind of have these um, these relig this religious iconography in their work as well. I definitely took a lot of inspiration from that. Um, and then the idea behind an altar, right? It's a practice that I implemented in honoring her only maybe like two years ago. Um, it's just a way for me to feel closer to her, right? Um, in a lot of different cultures, people um, use altars as a way to feel closer to their loved ones, manifest things, um, and you know, the list goes on. But um, the idea behind an altar is to have um, offerings like food that you can, that you're giving to the ancestor or the, the divinity that you are um, kind of honoring. Um, and so I have like a carafe full of water um, for one of them. I have objects of hers that are representative of who she was as well. Um, and all of that plays a part. And then um, also a big part of it was just um, the rose motif that I have throughout the images. Um, roses were a huge symbol in her life and in our life. She always had roses in the house, so they were her favorite flower. And the same way that she um, had that tradition of getting roses every week, I kind of continued that as well in like my own life. I try to make it a point to like reset, um, you know, have like a reset day and make sure I get like myself a bouquet and, and things like that. So just ways for me to um, feel closer to her and, and honor her in these different, different ways. That's beautiful. Can you talk more about the color white? in this piece? Because I know, I mean, it's just so white roses, the white coconut pig, which is her recipe, right? You yes, it's, it's, it's her recipe. She um, was definitely known for the white cake. My aunt's laughing because she brought it to like every, every holiday that we had and we almost got like sick of the cake, but now I find <laughs> myself like loving it, right? Um, but yeah, white is um, a symbol for um, like, <laughs> a little, it's a little morbid, but like, death, but also a sort of like rebirth, right? In a lot of cultures, white can be um, seen as like a symbol of death. But here, I think I was using it um, more so as this, this type of rebirth, right? Like you said, like breathing new life into who she was, right? right? Um, there's the idea behind photographs, right? When we think about a photograph, um, they, there was, um, Roland Barthes said that Photographs are kind of like an emanation of a subject, right? They're not just reflections, they're living things. And what connects them is um, like that, that camera between you and the subject. So it was, it's a way for me to, um, so like these are like living things, right? That's almost how I view them. Like even when we were setting up sometimes, like Brian, if he like, knocked over something or I'd be like, you know, like be careful with like my grandma almost, <laughs> right? Like that kind of idea. Um, so these are, yeah, definitely like living objects and sacred things that I hold very dear. So I wanted to have that come out as well. To get back to the mother-daughter crone idea, is there like a connection in each of the images and the diptych to each member of that or? Um, yeah. So. They're all about like different parts of, of who she was, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think in the in the sewing machine image, it's you know that love that she had for creating those things mm -hmm. um, for sewing, and then in the the middle image, it's also obviously honoring her cake and and that life, and then um, 
the, the beach image is also just honoring that, um, that cryptic. I, I wasn't trying to make it uh, throughout the whole series, yeah. just specifically that image. Yeah. And I also wanted to ask, you said that there's a, a significance to the location of yeah, each image? Absolutely. Um, uh, so yeah. these are all places that we spent a lot of time in together and that I held like really near and dear to me. Um, so the beach image, we spent a lot of time at Deerfield Beach together. Um, so we took the first image there. Um, was there, sorry to cut you off, was there a uh, significance to the time you shot it? I mean, it's beautifully lit, obviously, and perfectly composed with golden hour. Um, yeah, is that the sunset or sun? Yeah, so it, it's the sunrise. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely symbolizing like a new beginning um, in that way. Early morning light is also just logistically a lot nicer to shoot in as mm -hmm. well. Um, so it's, there's a logistic reason behind it as well. Um, but it, it also gives it kind of like an ethereal element to yeah. it as well. So I really wanted to have that shine through. And did you like use a reflector to light the altar? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Beautiful. Um, oh, okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we had like pretty intense lighting set up. Yeah. yeah, it's really, really well done. The little dash of pink reflected on the sand is really, it's just such a, I don't know, it's, it's such a tasty image. Like it's got so much in it. Also, the way the uh, two vases of roses are set up is almost precarious. They're so close to the edge. Was there any significance in that, or was it just about balancing the composition? Or? Mostly just balancing the yeah. composition, yeah, for sure. Um, There's something kind of more surreal about how they like are just on the precipice but stable. You know, it kind yeah. of adds to it. Absolutely. It's like um, the precarity of life, so to speak. You know? I like that. Yeah, <laughs> really, really stunning. And then also, is there a significance to the different colors of roses in each image? I so see you have red, then white, then pink. Yeah, so um, I wanted them to be able to kind of uh, almost be like a gradient almost oh. um, in different uh, parts of her life as well. Um, so yeah, and then, and then also for uh, the color, I wanted it to kind of go with like different aspects of the image as well. It's really, really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed that in the progression of these altars, you have one, two, and three one being probably in the most traditional sense, an altar. Then it kind of gets broken up a little bit. Like, okay, now we have food offerings and you know, we're still keeping the altar format of like there's a picture of her. But then you get to the third one and it's just the sewing machine with a rosary, a rose, and the big... The quilt. The yeah. quilt, yeah. How did, what was the Brazilian word for... I mean, Brazilian. Oh my God, que pena. Uh, the Portuguese word for that. Fuxico um, or something? It's, it's called, well, the scrap fabrics are just called fushiku, yeah. Fushiku, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, but uh, can you speak more to that about the sort of breaking down of, you have the most traditional altar here, you have this sort of uh, expanding the notion of what an altar means, which makes me think of people mourn differently. Uh, it becomes more and more personal. Um, so I think I definitely, I struggled a bit with just kind of accepting the idea of these images and um, these objects as part of like my visual repertoire and being able to <laughs> be this vulnerable, I guess, in, in, front, of, in front of people. So um, yeah, the images are, are broken up into like kind of, um, again, just like different aspects of who she was. I wouldn't say that, um, I think they're all altars in their own right. Um, I, I don't know if they're kind of like a, a breaking down of like grief. Um, I think it's more of um, a journey of acceptance, um, of me accepting um, her death, um, me accepting um, this idea of vulnerability, right? Um, but I think throughout the process, what was really amazing was that I was able to um, really come into my own and feel more empowered by, by the whole journey, um, which is really telling of um, just my grieving process in general. I feel like this is the culmination of like six years of grief now, right? And so it's, it's, it's a way for me to delve all of, all of those feelings into this. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. 
Yeah, I really like um, the inclusion of these different elements, right? Because you're exploring different ways of connecting with her. So it's not just photos. It's also like you have the actual cake. You have the quilt that she made for you. And I think that's a really beautiful way of exploring all the different ways of coping, of remembering, mm -hmm. of connecting you're with also, memories. You're like activating all the senses, you know, touch, taste, smell, sound, sight, and all those things are a tool to activate memory um, in a really profound way. You smell something and it takes you back to a certain time and place. And I think it's a really, it's a beautiful tribute to like the power of the matriarch of the family and their importance. Like a lot of this reminds me of my own grandmother who I'm luckily, lucky enough to say is still with us, but uh, my great grandmother made me a quilt like this immediately I saw it and I was like my great grandmother made me a quilt of scraps and I still have it and it has like my name and like birth date embroidered on it it's and beautiful. it's like just really touching and she, my grandmother has like a, she is like the family historian she collects all the images and every time you spend time with her you learn something new about everybody. your family <laughs> and it's like obviously like there's such a vast cultural difference like my grandma's from Michigan you know right. but just that kind of like universal sort of just like powerful spirit Truly. and that you are in your grief carrying on her legacy by doing her, the same work right you're collaging you're quilting and you're sort of bridging like across like these worlds where like she's still here like through this process which i think is just really really profound and so intelligently executed thank you yeah I'm really glad that you said the, the piece about um, activating all the senses, because that truly was, um, when, I, when I first started even conceptualizing and, and writing the show, that's, that was one of the first things I probably wrote down and, and spoke about with my friends. I, I wanted it to be almost, at first, like, kind of like a walkthrough of her home, oh. but I think it, it, it transformed a little bit more. I, I, I wanted to have... Um, I guess the physical altars here, mm -hmm. but just logistically, I think it would have been um, just too much for it. But mm -hmm. um, I'm glad that it was still able to hold the same sentiment. Yeah, I think it's a really, it's kind of like a deconstructed altar, the whole show as a exactly. piece. You know? I was just about to say, I think the whole, just all of us being here and, and being witness to the cake and everything else, mm -hmm. it's, it's an altar in itself, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it kind of makes you more aware of all the, when you take it apart, you become more well aware of what makes an altar function and why it works. Like, why, why do we all make altars across cultures right. in all these different ways? It's really interesting. Right. Exactly. Like, because the sewing machine is in context with the other altars, you start to think a sewing machine can be an altar mm -hmm. because it's doing the same function. Absolutely. Yeah. Whenever you accumulate things with significance, they start to hold a power. And accumulating symbols in a concentrated space makes it very potent. I wanted to ask about the audio. What was the decision there? Are there more recordings? as well or I wish there were more um, so she recorded this CD um, probably back in like the 90s or the 80s when she still lived in Brazil and when my uncles were here in America it was when they had first immigrated here and I think it was her way of just like sending back a little piece of herself and like her voice for them to kind of like feel connected to her in that way um, so uh, her um, her nephew João he um, had a little recorder, I guess, and he plays a lot of instruments. And um, this is a CD full of like recordings of him doing like covers. There's one, there's one um, intro where my grandma's sister also um, talks about um, just like a song that he covers and how much she loves it. And so it was, um, that was the only song that she uh, was able to record on there. But when I discovered it back in like 2018, like a year after she passed, it was like, flood of like emotions, um, especially because um, I wish I had saved more audio of hers. It's like one thing that like you forget mm -hmm. or like don't really like think about like, right? Like I had like voicemails that I mm -hmm. just didn't think to like yeah. save before, you know, obviously. Yeah. Um, but there's something so powerful about the human voice yeah. and being connected to somebody in that way that to be able to have like her literal presence in like 
in your, you know, in your ears is, is really powerful. So I really wanted to, to have this piece here. Yeah, and it's a very intimate choice too, not only to have us listen to her sing to us, which kind of reminds you of like, you know, again, the matriarchal role of singing a lullaby to the kid, um, but also just that it's very private, that we all individually put on the headphones, you know, that choice to not make it something playing on a loop, on a speaker, but rather like we have to go up, put the headphones on and press play ourselves. Like you're really engaging. It almost feels like, I felt a little bit like an intruder, honestly, like putting on the headphones and like, I was like, oh, can I just press play? Like, I just, it just felt so intimate. Like I was yeah. sort of like crossing this line into something so personal. I definitely want the viewer to feel like they're all discovering these artifacts with me. The same way that I um, was able to go through and, and find these things and in all of her bags, I still have all of her bags and like some of her, some of her clothes and jewelry and stuff. Like I, I wear her earrings like every day, her hoop earrings just to feel like closer to her. And, and the way that I was able to discover all these things, I definitely want um, people who are walking through to kind of feel the same way, right? Like I'm, oh, I'm, I'm kind of walking into, um, I don't know, somebody's living room or somebody's like, you know, intimate family photo album on just like a larger scale, so. Yeah, you definitely get a sense of that with the table runner and the cake and the flowers. It's, it feels a lot like a mesa, like in, this, in a house, a din dinner table. It's beautiful. Yeah, I noticed you using language like artifacts, anthropological, and to me that reads a certain, um, like those words typically have like a sort of academic detachment to them. But it's interesting that you're using that phrasing for something that is so deeply personal to you. And so I'm wondering like, is that indicative of any sort of detachments, any feeling that you may have had like, oh, I'm an outsider to this, to a certain extent. Obviously it's your family, but you know, right. as an immigrant and a first generation or second. First, I'm first not generation. yeah, is it? I don't even know, because I, I was born in Brazil, so I guess. Not even first, I don't know. Yeah, so you're, you're definitely like one foot here, one foot there. You're like straddling the line of what it means to be right. Brazilian and American. So right. could you speak more to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as much as you're comfortable with, obviously. No, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, just going back to what you said about um, the detachment. I think that's definitely something we all go through um, in grief. Um, she passed in like kind of a, a really difficult way for me and so there was definitely a lot of detachment um, in the beginning and so um, to I guess going through all of her things there was a level of detachment that I did have to have um, um, also just being like the first um, the first granddaughter there's almost like a little bit more of a, a responsibility um, kind of like what Betty was saying too about like um, being like the family archivist. I feel like that was almost like passed down to me now, right? Mm -hmm. Now I have that role. Um, but um, these are these images of my family. Um, they're like the closest thing that I have to being with them physically, right? Because I, I can't be in Brazil. Um, and so it's, they're very precious to me in that way. Um, so definitely on, on that line of like being here and, and being there, but mostly here. Right. Nidia aqui, Nidia, yeah, yeah, for sure. A lot, of, a lot of youth in Miami have that experience too, so I think it's also important that we're in this space specifically in a place like Little Haiti too, where it is like immigrant made. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people in the room can, can relate to that experience of yeah. you know being in one realm while also being in the other and sort of having to create your own third thing. The third culture kid experience exactly. is so real. And you mentioned Anna Mandieta before, and she sort of speaks to that experience a lot, right? Being from Cuba, coming here on the Peter Pan project, basically being ripped away from her home. And so, yeah, are there any other inspirations that, um, you know, maybe like uh, other artists that have uh, inspired you to do this project? Yeah, um, I think a big inspiration for me uh, is just 
the idea of nostalgia, right, and history. I think, as I said, you know, as someone who hasn't been back to their home country since they were three, I think nostalgia is a really powerful thing. Um, I'm, I'm quite literally delving from within and like using my, my own history as the basis for my art, right? Um, so, yeah, I think nostalgia, history are, are, are very important. And um, again, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, Edra Soto, their work was also hugely important to um, my research and just um, inspiration as well. Um, they did a piece called um, The Myth of Closure. Um, where they uh, they use a lot of images of their mother, and it's focused on their mother. Um, she passed away from uh, Alzheimer's or like complications from it, and so it was a way for her to grieve that as well. And there are a lot of like, it's almost like the progression of like her life, right? And she made these huge, beautiful like statues, and you kind of like have to get really close and kind of like look through like a a looking glass to see all these images of her mom. Wow. And I think um, that, was, that was really powerful. It's almost the same thing, like this voyeuristic type of thing that I kind of wanted to implement into this show as well. Um, and so, um, yeah, that was a huge inspiration for me. Absolutely. Uh, something that comes to mind when I look at your work, especially this piece behind us, uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, where he has a way of sort of remembering people through objects especially people that are very close to him, like his lovers, his family, um, you know, a pile of candy specifically, like, you know, you have the bed. a cake, the bed, yeah. right. Did you, did you consider, like, bringing a bed in here? A million percent. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Oh, my God. That was <laughs> one of the first con conceptualizations of this, too. Um, I, I also think um, I'm really grateful just to all of my friends, too, to have been like a listening ear for me throughout this whole process. Pamela, Solares, Brian Ramirez, um, Eva Patriglieri, they all kind of really heard me out throughout this. And um, yeah, um, <laughs> I actually told Eva about that and she was, she was the one who brought it up, right, the, the idea of the bed and mentioned Felix Gonzalez Torres and his, um, his billboard of the impression on the, the pillowcase to symbolize you know, the death of like, his lover. And I, I definitely wanted to um, um, kind of play with that idea. But again, logistics. Um, it's, it's a lot to um, project manage this, right? While also doing like a, having like a full-time job. So, um, but it's definitely an idea that I totally considered in the future. And his work is deeply moving. Speaking of the, the future, I wanted to ask, um, I mean, obviously you're going to sort of, I presume, continue this archivist role in your family that you've inherited, but as far as your artwork goes, you know, do you see this as a continuing project that you want to, or is that something you, you probably will just do personally, or do you want to do more photos of altars, or are there other sort of photographic ways that you thought of incorporating these same symbols? Yeah. Um... Sorry, could you mention that, that last part one more time? Yeah, There's just like, do you, have. do you have like other ideas and maybe photo series of incorporating these anchors, these symbols? Um, so I, I think that the idea of just like taking a photo of a loved one, right, is, is deeply like moving and powerful in itself. Um, so being able to kind of ph photograph like precious moments in life, um, is, is just really important, and that's definitely a motif that I hope to carry throughout my work, yeah. But um, as far as, um, I guess, archiving this and, and keeping it, I definitely think that there are, there are waves of um, reinterpreting like your own history, right? Mm -hmm. I love the idea of, of, of being able to kind of come back to a work um, at different stages of your life and at different points to be able to reimagine it in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely hope to do that in the future for sure. What is next for you? Uh, do you have any plans, whether they be vague or concrete, as to like how you want to expand your art practice 
even outside of this project in particular? Or what are your lofty goals? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think this is the beginning of, of something like really great for me. Um, it, it, again, it, it took a lot for me just to be able to feel confident enough to um, be able to be this vulnerable, right? And so um, I think this is just the beginning of like my more of more of this, right? More of my practice and, and all of that. Um, I don't know if I have something like very specific in mind right now, um, but yeah, it totally is the beginning. Yeah. Congratulations on your first solo show and thank you. Really opening yourself up and being vulnerable. It is probably the scariest part of sharing art in general, and especially for something this deeply personal. I really just want to commend you on you know, taking that big step. I think it's a really productive one. And again, I do think you're at the beginning of something really exciting, so. Thank you. Bravo. Yes. We really <laughs> could just keep going with this. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing this with all of us. Thank you for your time today. Give it up for Gabriella Mello, y'all. Thank you. <laughs> A really beautifully arranged show. The shows here just keep getting better and better with time, just more and more intentional with the way they're exhibited. And um, yeah, big ups on that. So where can people find you? Do you have like a website, a portfolio? Um, yeah, I have a website. I have a gallery on my website. I have Instagram. Um, follow me at Mellometer. Mellometer. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in today and stopping by. Big shout out to Miami Community Radio. Thank you for recording this. And now to celebrate Stephanie's birthday. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>